your name? Uh, Tim Sheehan, and I've been here, uh, I think I started about 1990 roughly. I used to work down there at the Hacienda before that, and there's quite a few quite a few people came down here, so I started as casual work and, and gradually, and I'm now the bookshop manager I've been for quite a while. Hacienda? Yeah, yeah. I used to work on the bar and the, and uh, the year 80, 86 to 88 or something like that. Right. Yeah, yeah. Upstairs? Uh, the, bit, the main bar, the big bar, yeah, yeah. Right. And, uh, what was the Hacienda like then? Um, well, actually, I think it had just started to go crazy when I <laughs> started to go crazy around 87, 88, yeah, so it was on the, the full uh, the house nights and stuff, you know. But it's kind of strange before then, because although it was busy on a Saturday, it was kind of uh, coach parties from out of town and things. And I used to like the Thursday night best, I think it was a, a night called Zumba, and they'd do yeah. sort of arty things, like they'd have their living paintings on the wall and they'd have uh, David Mack I think an artist did an installation on the dance floor with tyres and they had a karaoke it was a bit of a, it was a so much it was a good night the Thursday night I think because you got all this all the regulars were in there you know was that a Thursday? Thursday it was yeah was yeah. that Paul Collins used to do that? I think it was yeah 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 yeah, yeah, yeah. and they had uh, and uh, I think the Hacienda was a bit like a giant youth club really because you saw the same you know wherever you went in town you saw the same people there at night, whether, whether, whether you wanted to or not, really. But, you know, uh, really sort of cool and cultured crowd. Wasn't yeah, it was good. Yeah, 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 yeah. Okay, a nice, a really good mixed bag, actually. That's what made it interesting, particularly around the time of 88, when you got the, the sort of the mixture of the sort of the gay, high-energy crew, fashion students, musicians, and the Scallies all mixed together. And that was that was probably the best bit, I think. Uh -huh. yeah, and. Uh, and I came, yeah, I came down to Corner House. Uh, seen some fantastic films here over the years. Mm -hmm. um, Anything that sticks out? Um, I think has been your favourite. One of your favourites. Well, the one that blew me out most was uh, Tarkovsky, Andrei Rublev, and oh. I think I came in with a bit of a hangover. I was working as an usher at the time, and I just thought it was going to be a, a sort of typical sort of. Uh, uh, sword and sand, well not the sun, you know, like a biblical epic thing. And well, it came out three hours later, I just could hardly speak, you know, 1964. Uh, when I first saw The Idiots and Festin from the Lars von Trier and the Dogma, they were they were kind of exceptional. And in recent years, I thought, um, uh, Enter the Void, Gaspar, I can't pronounce his name, Gaspar No, Gaspar Noe, mm -hmm. thought that was mind blowing and I really liked Under the Skin last year, thought that was fantastic. Yeah. Uh, but I've seen some great stuff, yeah, and uh, exhibition wise, there's been Under some good stuff, yeah. John, yeah. Jonathan Glazer. Jonathan Glazer, yeah, yeah. Right, yeah okay. And I uh, thought that was a great film, last, favourite, favourite film last year, quite easily, yeah. Right, okay, that's pretty cool, yeah. that's interesting. Yeah, and uh, I think uh, exhibition wise they had a really good, um, they had one on Manchester design which of course was full of, sort of Hacienda, Ben Kelly uh -huh. um, and that was heaving, that was really good. Uh, Where was that? It was in the gallery, all three galleries, Sublime it was called the exhibition uh -huh. and it was just basically Manchester music, graphics and design, that was really good. So how would that rate as one of the um, best exhibitions here? That would probably be one of my favourite favourites. Mm -hmm. uh, I liked, and recently I liked the David Shrigley one, I thought that was brilliant. Yeah. I thought it was uh, it was accessible, um, people thought it was funny, P pa packed the place out, I made a fortune in here, which doesn't often happen, uh -huh. Uh -huh. Uh, on, the, on the back of it, you know, so it was, uh, yeah, I'm not trying to think, I'll see. Uh, so it's been, a, yeah, it's been a great place to work really, I think it's a good, I think Corner House has been um, greater than the sum of its parts, if you know what I mean, because sort of pe place of people just go and sit, hang out, people meet here. Um, so it's kind of, it's, it's, although it's uh, exhibitions and cinema, uh, it's more than that really. It's a kind of hangout sort of meeting place as well, you know. Yeah. Uh, you know, in, in, even back in the day when we used to go to the Hacienda, this was the main bar that we used to meet at to go for a drink, you know. Yeah. And I said, the interesting thing about that as well is that the uh, in those days, was this all, open after the house? Yeah, uh, this opened. Yeah, this opened about eighty-five. Oh, I think. Do you know who was involved in opening it? 
um, I think the original director was Dowie, Dowie Lewis. Right. Um, and is he like a Hacienda guy? No, no, no. He's, he, he actually, uh, I think he did a photography publishing firm. Alright. Um, but the, the, I say the interesting thing was when the bar first opened, that um, before that, um, public uh, places they had to have like frosted glass so you couldn't be seen to be drinking alcohol so when the Cornhouse Bar which was the first bar in Manchester that opened where you could be seen from the outside on the inside and it was a and people said oh, it's like it's full of poses and, and it was like a goldfish bowl but of course now every bar is like that you know every bar and cafe mm -hmm. yeah so it's really ahead of its time I think for that yeah yeah, yeah. and what do you think of the actual design of the interior um, I think it makes a good use of the space. I mean, it's not it, it's not built for purpose, if you like, because I think it, I think it was a carpet warehouse or something like that, or showrooms. Mm -hmm. So obviously Wasn't it something like a cinema. Before? I think Cinema One has always been a cinema. Mm -hmm. um, I think it was an um, adult cinema, cinema at one side. Adult cinema at one side. Mm -hmm. um, and this, I think, was something like it, it was like a carpet warehouse. Or, um, and obviously things that the public don't see as things like the lift and the you know the, it's an old building so it's not really built for purposes so it's an awkward shape as well but um, but I think it's what they've done with it is great really you know particularly gal like uh, gal gallery three the top gallery is a great space yeah. mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. so what's been the worst from you've seen Ooh. So it's the worst thing. Or even the worst exhibition. I mean, in, art, in the art world, I can't imagine anything being the worst, but... Um, <coughs> I'm trying to think, I think well, perhaps the, the guiltiest sin is to be a bit bland, and we've had a couple of bland ones up there that mm -hmm. I can't remember, I remember being unimpressed. I think some, sometimes, I think sometimes when, when work is very... Um, time based like I did like a video and you have to spend the amount of time with it. Mm -hmm. um, actually I just thought of another one I really liked which was uh, it was East European photography. I thought it was brilliant, really good. It didn't give you anything but it was it sort of drew you in, you know. Um, film wise uh, I'm trying to think actually. I saw a really awful low budget New York one. It was the genre was called Mumblecore uh -huh. and it was awful. Uh, I can't remember what it was called actually. <laughs> About seven, eight years ago. Uh -huh. um, I saw another film that really irritated me at the time but it it, it sort of grew on me and I, I couldn't I still I'm still thinking about it about ten years later and that was called Primer. It was, a, it was a science fiction. It built a time machine, but it was it was completely full of almost impenetrable scientific jargon. Mm -hmm. But it was a great. It was an interesting film. And, and then once the paradoxes of time travel kicked in, I was really lost. But <laughs> so I watched it again, and I, I, I thought, well, sometimes you don't have to know everything that's going on. And it was kind yeah, of interesting. Yeah. And it was interesting what to was be it done. Called? Primer, I think it's called. Yeah. Right. Forgotten the I've forgotten the director's name. Uh, I saw it in two, I think. Uh, oh. Yeah, probably about. Yeah, I think it's about ten years ago. Oh. And uh, but that was one that, it, although it bugged me, I couldn't stop thinking about it, and I just decided I liked it after all. You know. oh. so. And what do you think about the uh, the actual building closing, um, or um, changing and becoming something else? I think in in life you can't stand still. Um, as I say, this building in, in, in some parts of it is falling apart. Cinema One is owned by Rail Track anyway, I think, and they had a hole in the ceiling on one of the platforms. So there's, so probably, it's a shame in a lot of ways because it's such a nice, it's an iconic building. It's a, in a great spot, but who's to say down the line the new one won't be just as iconic? You know, I think it'll depend on. At the end of the day, people will be coming in for the product, so the films are good, the theatre's good, it'll be, you know, that should draw people in. Yeah. I think actually the interesting point there is the fact, the well, interesting point is that, like I say, I don't actually think about it. Actually, because I don't... I, I don't
undergone a remarkable transformation over the last decade, Manchester city centre skyline has changed dramatically. With world-class architecture and strong urban design, the city has a truly metropolis feel. But amid so much change is a key piece in the city centre jigsaw, an area that has managed to preserve its character, charm and uniqueness. Step a few yards away from Market Street down Tip Street and you're entering the Northern Quarter, an area that has become the heartbeat of the city's independent creative scene. It's home to many design agencies and renowned for its bars, boutiques, music, arts, cafes, clothes shops, as well as new urban housing, which makes the Northern Quarter stand out from the crowd. For award-winning photographer Edward Chadwick, the Northern Quarter's vibrant urban space provides plenty of inspiration for his work. I find the Northern Quarter adds an element of spontaneity to my work. The majority of the shots that I do around here are kind of very much spur-of-the-moment things. They're like little details, little little bits of time captured. Um, be that kind of a car outside one of the Northern Quarter bars. Just capturing the vibrancy of the area, that's what I try and do around here. Five years ago, Edward opened a studio in the Crafts and Design Centre, giving him the opportunity to be part of an artistic community where jewellery, textiles and fashion, and much more, is individually produced and sold on the premises. In fact, Oldham Street, at the heart of the Northern Quarter, was once one of Manchester's major shopping areas, but in the 1970s, the Arndale appeared, and the retail focus moved to Market Street. Back in the Northern Quarter, a new alternative culture started to develop, and the area became a haven for a thriving art scene. With their breathtaking ambition, Manchester's creative and artistic minds flocked to the Northern Quarter to offer a unique experience to the typical British high street. Simon and his wife Flix decided to move to the area three years ago to open their vintage shop, Rags to Bitches. The Northern Quarter has a very long history of fashion in Manchester because of the fact that it's been the Garment Quarter. The text I was finding these... I was, finding, I was finding this material from history um, and every so often something would have a particular resonance. I was kind of generally learning and learning and filing but then there were just moments when things seemed right and seemed pertinent to a particular moment and, and the, the factory work offered me this opportunity to, to um, share that idea or that image or that um, mood with uh, turn out thousands of other people. Joy Division second album Closer shows my interest in a photographic dimension of postmodernism. It's it's a neoclassical um, image uh, expressed through photography and um, accompanied by some very ancient typography. I think second century BC. But then. He borrowed the sign from the door, and it, it was actually the, the icon of the first factory poster. Hacienda started as a project in 8081 as a result of the kind of phenomenal sales of Joy Division's second album after Ian Curtis, the singer and writer, had, had died. So this phenomenal amount of money was directed into a, well, actually what became a hole in the ground called the Hacienda. The industrial warning stripes became almost like a signature motif of the Hacienda. Around about 81, 82, similar time, I was working on a cover for another band that had originally been with Factory Orchestra who was in the dark. I had an ongoing relationship with them. And um, I discovered a, actually a print, I think, by a 1920s artist called Edward Wadsworth. The image was called Dazzle. The design profession in general was trying to sort of push for that right through until, you know, the, the current era. And it's during the current era that, in a way, the cultural canon has become entirely, as I said, integrated, but now appropriated for the purposes of commercial practice. And that's where there's a, in a way, a disconnect. Um, and it then begins to become rather upsetting when you begin to realize that we're now selling out the culture for the purposes of marketing. 